Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back um, to the afternoon sessions of our 2022 Lupus Ontario Symposium. I hope everyone found the morning uh, presentations very uh, insightful, and I'm sure that you're going to find the afternoon ones equally so. Our theme is uh, basically uh, hope and new directions in lupus. So uh, we're hoping that all these presentations do give you a, a lot of hope for the future. My name is Linda Keel and I'm the president of Lupus Ontario. I just like to take a moment to give a shout out to Brent and his team who have put this event together because it's certainly been a, a wonderful event with great speakers. So I thought I would slip that in there at the beginning. Uh, our next speaker is uh, no stranger to many of you who are attending today. Uh, Dr. Costas Selios came to Canada from Greece in 2014 uh, for the Lupus Ontario Jeff Carr Fellowship. Uh, he served his fellowship at Toronto Western Hospital under the supervision of Drs. Eurowitz and Gladman. In 2017, he once again won the fellowship and continued his studies at Toronto Western. More recently, he has joined the team at McMaster University in Hamilton, where he is an assistant professor of Department of Medicine in the Rheumatology Division. We're very glad he didn't go very far from, uh, from the, and stayed in the GTA. Uh, he recently established the Lupus Ontario and Matheson Biobank which will provide samples which can be used for many years in lupus research. And he continues to perform research and see patients at the Boris Clinic at McMaster Health Sciences. He's gained a reputation as a very knowledgeable and compassionate doctor, and his expertise is sought out uh, by many. We're delighted that Dr. Celios has decided to remain in Canada and continue his work to improve the lives of lupus patients here and abroad. Today, his topic is lupus nephritis, new hopes. Welcome, Dr. Celios. Linda, thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. And uh, I would like to, uh, to thank the organizing committee of the symposium for this kind of invitation. I really uh, appreciate this. And you know, I'm grateful to Lupus Ontario, not only for this invitation, but for all uh, your support all these years. So I will say a few things today about new hopes for lupus nephritis. Uh, it's an exciting year for, new, for lupus nephritis. And uh, we, we have new drugs after many, many years. And we have lots to discuss, lots to learn. And uh, hopefully to improve. This is the, uh, the, the desire of all the, uh, the lupus specialists to improve the outcomes of our patients. So probably you heard from Linda, uh, our clinic at McMaster is financially supported by Lupus Ontario. We are building the Ann Matheson uh, Biobank repository of uh, blood samples and DNA samples of patients with lupus with the ultimate goal to, uh, to conduct research on, uh, on this disease. Now, I won't only talk about the, uh, the new therapeutics, the new drugs, I'll tell you a few things about what we know uh, for lupus nephritis, how important the problem is, what we do and what we can do up to now, what are the unmet needs if we're doing as well as we think uh, we are, and then we'll talk a bit about the, uh, the new drugs and discuss the, uh, the place of the treatment algorithm. So lupus nephritis, most probably the, the, the most impactful manifestation of, of lupus. Why I'm saying this? Because it's the more prevalent uh, from the internal organ involvement, as we say. We say that we have the joints, we have the skin, we have the internal organs, and then when it comes to the kidneys, this is the most likely to be affected in the course of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. If you want a number, this like uh, ranges from 35 to 40%, sometimes 50% in large cohorts. And it's more likely to occur early in the CIS course in the first few years. Mostly women, but of course lupus is uh, appearing mostly in women. The same numbers, like almost 90% of patients with lupus nephritis are women. 
The disease itself has like a clinical and histopathological heterogeneity. It, it manifests quite differently from patient to patient. And we'll see a few things about this. And of course, lupus nephritis affects prognosis. It's a major determinant of prognosis, increased burden on survival and quality of life. We'll see a few things about the cost, uh, not only because the, uh, it is so high, but because the new drugs are uh, costly as well. So we said it happens early in this CIS course, right? And this comes from the University of Toronto database. We had 653 patients with biopsy confirmed lupus. So there was no uh, doubt that we had to deal with lupus nephritis. So based on the age of renal biopsy, you will see that, let me take this out. Okay, you will see that most of our patients almost, if we, if we go up to 50 years of age, almost 90% of our patients had the renal biopsy uh, before the age 50. Why I'm sending off the, uh, the kidney biopsy? Because in order to ask for a patient to go into an invasive procedure and get a piece of the kidney, this is what we mean by a biopsy, we have like significant, like serious reasons to do this, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't put you in danger or any risk by doing this. And 75% of them is up to the age of 40. So it really happens early. Past some point, we don't expect any significant issues from lupus nephritis. And 42.6 upon lupus diagnosis, the first manifestation of disease comes from the kidneys. What I meant when I said something about clinical heterogeneity, uh, what, what is the bad thing with the kidneys? They don't take. And since they don't take, many of our patients will not pay attention to this. And many of the doctors and even rheumatologists will not pay attention to this. Why this is happening? Because the patient will not complain. The patient will complain about the joints because it's painful. Uh, they may complain about the, uh, the skin, right, particularly if it affects the, uh, the face or we have some problems with the scalp, with alopecia, this hair loss. But when it comes to the kidneys, nobody's complaining. The patient may have symptoms and signs of generalized disease activity, so a full-blown flare with arthritis, with skin disease, with rashes and all this. She may uh, exhibit constitutional symptoms like fatigue, right, and most likely, the patient will come with an elevated blood pressure. How, how often we see patients with elevated blood pressure in the context of active lupus nephritis? In about 50 to 60%. How often any given physician will think of lupus nephritis if he or she has a patient, a, a young female, like 30 years old, this is the, the mean age at uh, diagnosis of lupus nephritis in, uh, at least in Canada. How often will we think that the patient may have lupus nephritis because of elevated blood pressure? Quite unlikely. I have seen this time and time again when the patient was uh, treated for hypertension at the age of 30 or 31 or 32. And the, the, the cause of this hypertension was exactly uh, an active uh, inflammation in the kidney. When it comes to the, uh, to the blood tests or urine tests, we see protein in the urine, this foamy, they will say urine. I don't know who is uh, checking his urine every so often. But anyway, the old, the older textbooks anyway, uh, they mention this foamy urine as a sign of, uh, of lupus nephritis. By active urinary sediment, we mean red blood cells like blood in the urine. We mean white blood cells, this pyuria, and they get together and they form this cast that we see under the microscope and we uh, can determine the activity of the disease based on that. Increase in serum creatinine, that is the thing that we don't like to see. When the serum creatinine goes up, that means that we already have some impairment in the kidney function and we'll talk uh, about this later. And of course, serology, mainly with the complements and anti DS, DNA antibodies, these are the major uh, immunology markers that have been linked to uh, lupus nephritis activity. So from nothing, 
to very, very bad when it comes to the clinical presentation of uh, lupus nephritis. What is happening? I don't want you to, to, to look at this, right? This is only for really, really interested physicians in this. If you see, if you imagine that this is the kidney, oh, sorry for that. If you imagine that this is the kidney, if we go in, 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 and deep, 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 we will see this nephron. This is the anatomical unit of the kidney, right? And each kidney has about 1 million of these little thingies. And each little thingy is affected in the course of lupus nephritis with multiple uh, inflammatory cells, immune cells, and uh, soluble mediators, inflammatory proteins, and all these things will come in here and will start giving trouble. What kind of trouble? We don't know what kind of trouble. That's why we ask our patients to have a kidney biopsy. Like multiple and several discussions over the necessity of the kidney biopsy and if this will uh, have any more information to provide. But in any case, we believe and we have shown time and time again that kidney biopsy is important. Right, so if our patients have any of these uh, issues, we ask for this why to confirm the nature of the damage. Right, what class of lupus nephritis? We have six different classes of lupus nephritis. So even all the patients with lupus nephritis are not the same and will not have the same outcome uh, over time. We will be able to individualize the therapeutic approach based on the biopsy. Again, not all patients will respond to the same treatment based on the kidney biopsy. And of course, we need to assess prognosis. We need to know uh, what will happen in the future. So this is an important step. And now more and more uh, lupologists, the lupus specialists anyway, uh, agree that the kidney biopsy is required in case of, uh, of a suspected lupus nephritis. And if we do the kidney biopsy, we may see six different classes. As we said, from class one, no trouble, to class three and four, this is the most uh, aggressive form of lupus nephritis, the proliferative form, as we call it. Class five and class six, not shown here, class six, is the, the histopathologic equivalent of end stage uh, renal disease. Things are not good and will not uh, go, go well. What is happening in, uh, in Toronto when it comes to, uh, to classes of lupus nephritis? Based on this 653, we had 2% of non lupus nephritis, right? It may happen. Our patients have other issues as well. They may have diabetes, they may have uh, some other uh, renal diseases, and they will not need treatment. On the contrary, if we give them the treatment that we give, usually for lupus nephritis, we will harm them. Right, so it's important to know what is happening. And when it comes to the classes, mostly about one third of our patients had findings of this diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis, the class four, the most anyway aggressive, the with the worst outcome. What is the natural course of lupus nephritis? What is happening, say, if we don't treat the patient, if we do nothing, we just fall. Right, at the very beginning, we will only see, if we're lucky, some mild protein urea, some protein in the urine. Maybe a few milligrams, maybe like a couple of grams, but anyway, if left untreated and checked, this will continue rising. And eventually at some time, the kidney function, the renal function will start getting lower and lower. Now, if we're lucky and we diagnose, we capture the patient and we uh, administer the appropriate treatment, the proteinuria hopefully will go down and the renal function will remain normal. And these are the stages of the uh, of kidney function. This is based on the on the worldwide initiative of uh, of nephrologists. From stage one, normal kidney function. Stage two, so so. But anyway, we consider this to be okay uh, prognostically. Stage three, 
symptoms and trouble may arise here at this level. Stage four is one stage before dialysis and uh, stage five is dialysis. Dialysis, I have this here with red, why? Because the patient, any given patient going on dialysis automatically is characterized by an increased risk for cardiovascular events, for infections, for other complications, and eventually death. These patients will lose, and we know that for sure, will lose about 10 to 15 years of life uh, when they go to dialysis. Right, what was happening up to, to very, very recently? The outcome we were considering the most important was this stage five. And we were trying to find out what is happening what are the factors that will drive any given patient with lupus nephritis to stage five kidney disease or end stage renal disease and uh, dialysis? Right, I don't think that this is the most appropriate outcome. We have stage four and we have shown a couple of years ago from the University of Toronto, I was doing this study, that stage four lupus nephritis for patients who reach stage four, will go on to dialysis in 60% in three years. So this is why in my most uh, recent studies, I moved the target to stage four and stage five in order to, to raise awareness and see what is happening before any patient will reach stage four. When he or she reaches stage four, things are difficult. Not any way a, a death sentence for the kidneys, but things get difficult. So what are we doing to prevent this? We had some medicines, some drugs. I don't know how many of the, uh, of the attendees had this uh, experience actually on getting this kind of treatment. But until recently, we were following the guidelines, the treatment guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism. I will give, show you this uh, in the next slide. We're talking about prednisone, prednisone, and again, prednisone, tons of prednisone, to be honest. And then uh, we're giving our patients something called mycophenolate mofetil or CELSAT or cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide could be uh, in the oral form, we prefer the intravenous form for a six months, right? In conjunction with the, uh, with the prednisone. And then depending on the response, we were saying, if you started with MMF, with the mycophenolate, you will switch to cyclophosphamide if the patient didn't respond and vice versa. Of course, if the patient doesn't respond, this is a, a totally different discussion and the, uh, the chances of getting to advanced chronic kidney disease or even end stage renal disease are increasing substantially. If we go to the other side of the pond, right, to Europe, the EULA, the uh, European League Against Rheumatism, and this is the Renal Association and the Dialysis and Transplant Association, they had more uh, recent guidelines, but nothing uh, much changed. We're talking about the same drugs in the same doses. We had a new drug from 2012 to 2020, that acrolimus here, if there was like a particular uh, severity in the initial inflammation. Again, cyclophosphamide and then steroids, pulses to begin with intravenous steroids. Uh, this is what the, the pulse therapy, followed by prednisone, a bit lower dose uh, from 2012 to 2020. Why? Because we, uh, we understood that prednisone in high doses, we don't gain much, one, and we give more trouble to our patients uh, from the damage perspective. And then they were talking about hydroxychloroquine, you know, Plaquenil, it comes here as well. Why? In order to decrease the, uh, the rate of less, it has nothing to do with uh, active lupus nephritis, right? We don't expect many, many things from Plaquenil in this uh, stage. But for, uh, following the, uh, the remission, if we're lucky, Plaquenil is supposed to help with decreasing the rate of, uh, of flares. And then we were talking, that was the first time, about the maintenance therapy with mycophenolate or azathioprine for three or five years after achieving complete remission. So you understand that lupus nephritis is not 
a hundred yard race is a marathon. We're talking about the five year block if everything goes well or more if we have any complications. What are the targets of treatment and what we're trying to achieve with this treatment? We're trying to reduce the proteinuria. These are the, uh, the, the goals of treatment, again, by the European Association. We're trying to reduce the proteinuria by 25% uh, at three months, 50% at six months, and then get to complete remission. This is what this means. UPCR is protein creatinine ratio anyway, some urine test, but we're trying to get to complete remission by 12 months. And at the same time, to reduce the steroid dose, the prednisone dose to 7.5 or less. And we know that this will offer the, the best outcomes that we can have in lupus nephritis. How good are we in achieving these outcomes? This is the million dollar question, actually. Um, if you see what I'm doing here, I gathered the information from the clinical trials that were done in lupus nephritis, the randomized clinical trials. They're supposed to be, anyway, the, the best uh, possible way to study any given medicine. You will see that in the beginning, this is PREVA trial, uh, checking on the mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. This is on six months only. But anyway, they had a complete... Uh, response rate of 8.6 and 8.1 percent, horrible. Then we had the the rituximab trial in 2011. We were much hopeful about this, like that that would be like a, a revolution in the therapeutics of lupus nephritis and lupus in general. But unfortunately, the drug the drug did not work. The rate of complete response was close to 30 percent. Then we had this. Tacrolimus study from China only about 2016, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't see any, any subsequent randomized controlled trials after that, and I don't know why. But in this study, we only had Chinese patients. Tacrolimus achieved like a 46% uh, complete response. The Bliss Lupus Nephritis trial, this is the trial I'm going to talk about later and the Aurora One trial. The Bliss Lupus Nephritis with uh, Belumab, you know Bliss, that's the first biologic we ever had uh, in lupus. Right, they achieved a complete response rate of 47%. The Aurora one with that Voculosporin, uh, 41%. And this comes from the University of Toronto Lupus Clinic before 2003 and after 2003. Why I did that? Because after 2003, we had uh, mycophenolate mofetil, it was more readily available. We had uh, other drugs, better antihypertensives to control the blood pressure that comes with lupus nephritis. Anyway, the, the approach uh, was significantly different. And we praise ourselves and we think we, that we are doing very, very well worldwide and we have like probably the best rates, I dare say. Uh, when it comes to uh, development of end-stage renal disease, and we only achieve 49% of complete renal response at 12 months. So the goals we set uh, before, right, complete response by 12 months, is achieved by less than 50% of our patients. And what is happening with this, uh, with this lupus nephritis? And since we don't achieve that, that great of a response, the prognosis is not great. This is based on a meta-analysis of more than 18,000 patients with lupus nephritis from 125 studies worldwide, not including studies with the new drugs. Right, so the 10-year risk for end-stage renal disease and dialysis was 17% in developed countries, like in Canada. In Toronto, we had 9.3% when I checked. But anyway, all given, uh, we have a 17%, 17% of our patients with, uh, with lupus nephritis will develop, will be on dialysis after 10 years. And this is, this is really, really uh, frightening to me, particularly if you consider the age at lupus nephritis diagnosis. We're talking about patients who start at the 30, 31, 31 point something was the mean age 
from these 653 people I showed you from the, uh, from the Toronto Lopez Clinic. So by the age of 40, one out of five will be on dialysis. And if we go to uh, the, the diffuse proliferate, that class four uh, lupus nephritis, we're looking at 33% at 10 years and 44 at 15 years. So before the age of 50, half of the patients with diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis will be on dialysis. And this is, this is really, really uh, uh, terrifying, right? So what we're trying to, to achieve now is to improve these numbers to get our patients out of this risk, to minimize the risk for developing such bad outcomes, right? And we have two new drugs for lupus nephritis now. We'll go uh, quickly through the studies that blaze lupus nephritis trial, randomized control trial to compare Belima to placebo plus standard of care. In lupus nephritis in, and lupus in general, we don't have uh, a placebo arm. The patients will be taking the standard of care treatment. And the standard of care is what we discussed uh, earlier. We're talking about steroids, about salt or cyclophosphamide, plus the, uh, the plaquenil and all those things. And the other arm will be taking the same drugs plus the new drug, the Benlista, uh, for this study. Duration, two years, they had 448 patients. The usual dose for, uh, for Benlista. And they had this primary and secondary endpoints we don't mind, but what we do mind is that they had the combined endpoint of renal event or death. Death, why? Because we have uh, patients with lupus nephritis who will develop end stage renal disease are at high risk of, of dying from complications, uh, from infections, from uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, from heart attacks that can occur even during the dialysis sessions and all those things. Anyway, we didn't have enough, like many anyway, for the duration of the study because it was only two years. They only had like one death in the Belima arm, two deaths in the placebo arm. But altogether with the deterioration of the, uh, the renal function, we're talking about a 50% reduction of the risk of a renal function deterioration or death combined. And that was significant. This is like the, uh, the rate of accumulation of events in the placebo arm and here in the Belumab arm, 50% improvement, well, well done. Uh, Belumab helps a lot patients with active lupus nephritis. When it comes to two years, they had like a 43% uh, complete response. At one year, 47%, so a few less uh, had maintained the complete response in two years, and we'll discuss about this. And if you go to complete renal response, the previous definition, we're looking at 30%. What we uh, discussed before for how, how good we are in achieving the goals. The probability of renal event or death, this 0.51 means that there was a 49% reduction in the risk for this. No particular uh, safety concerns. It worked well, we didn't have any issues, and this drug has been approved from the FDA and from Health Canada. We are now uh, trying and we submitted the, uh, our input to, uh, to Cardiff in order to gain uh, public reimbursement for in, in some patients, not all of the patients with lupus nephritis, but anyway, in some patients to get public reimbursement for Belimab, for Belista in lupus nephritis. The other trial was that Aurora 1 trial and the new drug is uh, called voclosporin. Again, voclosporin plus placebo, one arm, plus, plus standard of care, one arm, placebo plus standard of care, the other arm. We don't leave uh, patients with lupus or lupus nephritis without any treatment, for God's sake, even in randomized control trials. Duration 52 weeks only, and I'm saying only because one year it's really, really a short time to, uh, to determine outcomes in lupus nephritis and in lupus. They had 357 patients. This is an oral drug. So we're talking about pills, no infusions, no injections, no nothing, pills, but daily. And the primary endpoint was exactly this, the complete renal response. 
what they showed is that there was a significantly higher percentage of patients achieving complete response at week 52 by the end of the first year, uh, 41% versus 23% here in the, in the placebo arm. And then when it comes to patients who had partial renal response by five cell, we mean a reduction of 50% in the proteinuria. They had a response of 70% in the uh, voclosporin group versus 52% in the uh, placebo plus standard of care group. So again, no particular concerns about safety. They didn't have any issues. So the drug worked well. Again, voclosporin is uh, approved by the FDA and Health Canada now for, uh, for the treatment of active lupus nephritis. I, I'm not aware of any uh, attempt to cut it for public reimbursement. I don't know if they, uh, they will go for this and if they will ask our input or our support, but this drug is really, really expensive. We're talking about $97,000, $98,000 a year. So what is the place of these drugs in the therapeutic algorithm of lupus nephritis? As we said, we're talking about cell sap, that mycophenolate mofetil, right, or the myphotic, the, it's uh, one and the same, or cyclophosphamide. And it seems that we may have belimumab from day one, or at least very, very early during the course of treatment in order to, uh, to give it some time to achieve remission, right? Because belimumab is not working overnight. It needs like several infusions before it kicks in. Uh, and we will go, of course, all the way for at least 12 months. And then voclosporin, I'm still uh, having a question mark here. Why? One, because of the cost. Two, because of the, um, of the length of follow-up of the treatment for Berlin. For Belista, we have like two years at least of, uh, of data. For voclosporin, we only have uh, one year. So I would wait to see what is happening in the second year, how many of these patients may flare, what, what, what's going on with this. And of course, rituximab, this is the drug we talked about uh, in, in 2011, we had the Luna trial, but anyway, it didn't work. We only have this in very, very selected cases in the refractory cases where like nothing worked and, and we may decide to give this in order to gain something. We talked about the, the cost of these drugs and, and that, this is the major issue. Right, when it comes to public reimbursement and when it comes to availability, like how many patients will be able to get this drug for uh, lupus nephritis? We don't know, we hope that the, uh, the, the verdict will be positive for patients with lupus nephritis. And this, is, this comes from a Canadian study, nationwide study from Dr. Barber in Alberta. They showed that patients with end-stage renal disease from lupus nephritis cost about $50,000 a year uh, to the system, right? So we're talking about lots of money and even the stage three uh, advanced chronic kidney disease, this is the, the prior classification. It corresponds to the stage four that I showed you. We're talking about more than $20,000 a year for anyone. Of, uh, of these patients. Now, this is what is happening with the new drugs. I'll tell you a few things about what is affecting prognosis and what we are looking for and what I'm trying to work upon when it comes to lupus nephritis. Because the truth of the matter is that we haven't addressed these factors adequately, in my opinion. I'll tell you why. The factor that comes Time and time again in all the prognostic studies is serum creatinine. What does this mean? The baseline renal function. So you'll allow me to go to this slide to explain what I mean. The baseline serum creatinine is reflected in this renal function. If a patient comes to me here in the, in the early stages of lupus nephritis, I will be most likely able to save the kidneys and go like this all the way. If the patient comes here, the risk is 50%. If the patient comes here, 
most likely she will develop end stage renal disease and she will go dialysis no matter what. Uh, we have very, very uh, sparse data when it comes to patients at that stage, because patients at that stage are not even included in the randomized clinical trials. They're excluded. So whatever goes below 30 in this stage four uh, kidney disease, these patients can't, are not eligible to make it. So they will not be treated. And even if I treat them with the, with the available drugs, with tons of prednisone and salt and cyclophosphamide, most likely I will give them trouble and not benefit. So this is very, very important. And, and what I'm trying to, to advocate for this, I'm trying to advocate that every lupus patient will have her or his creatinine checked in every single visit. I know some, it, may, it may sound too much, but we will be able to save more than any other drug by doing this. Then the severity of proteinuria, right? If I'm here, I will be able to save the kidneys. If I'm here, the chances are less. It will be a more severe disease. And most likely if we're here, the renal function will be less as well. That's why in every visit, I'm checking my patient's urinalysis to see how much protein, if any, I hope none, uh, what, what, what's happening with the urine. Because proteinuria is a very, very early indicator of damage to the kidney than renal function. This starts first, the protein starts first, and the serum creatinine follows. Histopathological characteristics, okay, what is happening from the kidney uh, biopsy? And if we are late in disease course, we will have more chronic, thus irreversible damage. If we are in earlier cases, in earlier stages, we will see activity and I can reverse activity. I cannot reverse chronicity. The time of response, rate, we'll, I'll talk about this, race, ethnicity, black people, unfortunately, do not have... Uh, like very good outcomes when it comes to nephritis, flares, duration of immunosuppressive treatment, compliance, and of course others are talking about blood pressure, about diabetes, about infections, and other acute events. What I mean by time to remission, this is what I'm working on now, and I'm presenting to the ACR in a few weeks in, um, in, in Philadelphia. I uh, studied 418 patients with lupus nephritis, active lupus nephritis, and we followed them for five years or more, at least five years, all of them, and then uh, until the last visit. Anyway, and I stratified them by timing to uh, complete response. So with the green line, you will see patients who had achieved remission, complete remission within the first year, right? So they achieved the target, they achieved the, the, the goal. The, uh, with the orange, the patients who had remission between one and less than three years, right? And with red, the patient who achieved remission after three years or they did not achieve remission. We had only 8% of patients who did not achieve complete remission uh, over time in, uh, in the Toronto Lupus Clinic. So these are the outcomes, right? So the patients who had the remission within the first year, it was highly unlikely for them to develop end-stage renal disease even after 20 years from diagnosis. The patients who had a remission between one and three years, they did as well for the first decade, as you see here, and then they differentiated themselves. I don't know why, I'm still, I'm still trying to understand this and, and, and go deeper and see what happened here, right? But they didn't do well for the second decade. Now for the patients who did not achieve remission or had this very, very late in this course, things didn't go well. They went, almost 40% of them went on to advanced uh, kidney disease in 20 years. So we need to be careful when it comes to time to remission. We need to achieve remission early. What's happening with flares is similar issue. Flares, we mean that you achieve remission, but you have a risk of flare, right? Now for the first five years from diagnosis, patients who did not have any flare, they did well, about 40% of our patients, they did very, very well over the next 20 years. Patients who had one flare, they did well for this like 12, 13 years. And after that, 
they paid the price. Patients who had more than two flares, two or more, uh, sorry, about 37.6% of them, they went on to develop uh, advanced kidney disease by, the, it was like close to 75%. Why the flares happen? The flares happen because for one day, one reason or the other, the patients discontinued the, uh, the maintenance therapy. We said about uh, EULA, the European Association, and the recommendation of maintaining the, uh, the immunosuppressives for three to five years. And this is what is happening if you take immunosuppressives for more than three years, the green line, and if you take immunosuppressive for less than three years, the orange line. And when I went deeper into the charge of these patients to see like why, uh, what happened with the flares, I saw that the most significant issue, the most important uh, factor was compliance. The patients were stopping the medicines. Uh, I don't blame them. I'm trying to understand why they're doing this and I'm trying to, to, to find ways to help with this. Because these are the number of drugs, literally, that a 30 year old healthy patient will be taking from one day to the next when she comes to my office for active lupus nephritis. She will come with no drugs and she will leave my office with 29 or 30 uh, tablets. And this is the, the, the good scenario. And she will be taking these drugs for many, many months. And some of them will continue for many, many years. So how easy is for, for this patient to, to accept all this? I don't know. And of course, we can't achieve this with a 30-minute with a discussion. Right? I'm trying to reach out to my patients again and again to see what's happening, to, to, like, to, give, them, to give, give them some support, some, some moral boost. Okay, we're making it. Uh, I'm trying to communicate with them. I'm trying to, to engage them, to make them a, uh, a, a co-worker anyway uh, in, in this, right? And I hope that uh, they will not stop taking the medicines. Anyway, about 40% of the lupus nephritis patients who did not do well with rapid deterioration of renal function were non-compliant. And I saw that in some patients who achieve early remission and then flare quickly, non-compliance is the leading factor. They feel better. The numbers are getting better. The papers are looking better. They feel great. Okay, so they will stop the medicine. It doesn't work this way, unfortunately. And this was the major factor that give them uh, flares and eventually bad outcomes, even in this group, right? This group, the best group, they achieved complete remission within the first year, but still after 20 years, by the age of 50, right, the rate was not 100%, it was actually 93 or 94%. And I checked this charge of the, we had like 14 patients who did very, very well and something happened here and they developed, and these patients at some point, they stopped their medicines or they had infections. And we advised them to stop the medicines because of the infections. Right, because all these medicines we use are immunosuppressives. So these are the factors that give us the most trouble with, uh, with lupus nephritis. And I think that we should address them uh, strongly and, and, and consistently to achieve the best outcomes for uh, our patients. So this is my last slide. <laughs> Right, I love this uh, gift. Actually, I, I I can only imagine the, uh, the the terror in George Constanza's eyes in the '90s. I don't know when Seinfeld was uh, was filmed. I guess in the '90s. In the '90s, we didn't know much about lupus nephritis. We were more afraid of lupus. Now we know more. We know what to do. We are trying to engage the patients in this fight uh, for better outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. I think that we can uh, proceed to questions and dances now. All right, so we have a question here. Um, it's asking, 
Unary markers like CD163 will be available to help in the early detection of LN. And then I think he's asking a little bit more about the details about LN treatments and if it if it includes a steroid or a free steroid. Right. Oh, do you want me to go uh, oh. like question by question? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, what do you, we mean? I guess the audience is not so uh, so familiar to the urinary markers like CD one sixty three, but in any case, there are like several studies now. We are trying to identify markers in the urine primarily in the blood as well, but in the urine mainly, or a cluster of markers uh, to see how, if, if they reflect disease activity. And many, many labs around the world are working on this and you will find uh, many papers on this. What is my problem with this and my, uh, my objection? All of the studies, what they do is to study to compare a given marker like this is CD163, to proteinuria, right? So if I have to measure the protein in the urine and follow the protein in the urine, both for monitoring and to, to achieve the target and, and to define the response, why do we need like a, another market? I would like to see a market that could predict proteinuria. I, could, I would love to see an earlier market than that. I don't know how we can do this, but anyway, if we have like a marker that costs say $20 per sample with protein that costs 20 cents per sample, I don't know how this will work. But anyway, I, research is uh, ongoing to identify markers like, uh, like this. So for maintenance treatment, if we can, if we should have steroids or free, ideally free, ideally. If we need steroids, Whatever is above 7.5 is not acceptable. We know that the patients, our patients will get into trouble, right? Whatever comes above 7.5, I would try other approaches to, uh, to achieve remission. Uh, why we did not observe that mycophenolate equals cyclophosphamide as induction plan for severe cases in lupus nephritis? I don't know what you mean by uh, severe cases. Based on randomized control trials, they didn't find any significant, statistically significant anyway, uh, difference between the, uh, the cell sept and the cyclophosphamide. And of course, from both ACR and the, uh, the European Association, the recommendation is this to switch between treatments if the patient does not respond to, uh, to any of this. Now, step-by-step -step treatment or multi-targets from the start to fasten treatment duration and minimize side effects of steroids. I would like to go with multi-targets from the start. I, my, uh, my, my approach is this, actually to hit hard and hit early if necessary. Of course, my patients know that I'm not a huge uh, supporter of multi-drugs or anything. But when it comes to lupus nephritis, we don't have many choices. Right, now the MMF drug level and plaquenil drug levels. Unfortunately, no, I'm not monitoring the drug levels. We don't have the, uh, uh, the, the assay to do this for the plaquenil, I mean, in uh, Hamilton Health Sciences. We do monitor MMF in conjunction with the uh, transplant people but not for, uh, for lupus nephritis. If I'm seeing any uh, toxicity with MMF, with the microphenolate, this is most commonly diarrhea. And I'm asking my patient to report this and let me know. And of course, this is dose dependent. We will go to lower doses. As long as they can take, they can tolerate two grams a day. I'm, I'm satisfied with this. Now, in patients with Benlista or Rituximab, did you follow up serum IgG or CD19 count to decide the next doses or give at fixed time regardless? For Rituximab, yes, I'm following the CD20 counts uh, to see what's happening. 
right, CD19 is the market, the general market for B cells. I'm following the CD20 as well to see like when this will come back uh, and, and will arrange for, for treatment. I don't think that we'll gain anything if we go with fixed time, uh, particularly if the patients are not having any CD20. I have seen this time and time again in other patients who were receiving rituximab, so I'm saying probably there's no, uh, no, no, no target. Right. A question from Brent. Can you expand a little bit on why a patient with more extensive kidney damage is excluded from clinical trials? Is it a function of risk to the patient? No, it's a function of risk to the study. Right. So this patient will not uh, respond. And if the patient will not respond, uh, it's likely that the study will not be positive. Even if the study is not positive, it will not get approval. Okay, it's as simple as that. Uh, Nobody is looking at these patients. I had 118 patients of this group, if I'm not mistaken. I published this a couple of years ago from the, uh, the Toronto Lopez Clinic. Stage four uh, nephritis patients, they went to dialysis, 60% of them went to dialysis in three years uh, from the time they did they hit stage four uh, uh, kidney disease? Now, so it, it, they're not attractive targets for, uh, for randomized clinical trials. Of course, when this patient comes to the clinic, you cannot say you're not eligible, right? I'm not doing randomized clinical trials. I'm doing clinic and I'm taking care of patients and not uh, papers. So I will try to do my best. And this is the best, the best rates we have, right? 60% dialysis in three years. So no, no wonder the randomized clinical trials, anyway, the, the pharma sponsored trials will not uh, include such patients. No, another question, Look, is it acceptable in general to stop 24-hour urine tests when the remission while still following blood work? This seems to make sense, but now I'm wondering if proteinuria should always be checked at appointments. Uh, you don't have to do 24-hour urine collections for this. We have a marker called albumin to creatinine ratio, and we check this in spot urine samples. So if you give me a sample, I can check this, the albumin to creatinine ratio. If this is so elevated, I can ask you... Uh, a 24 hour urine protein, this is the gold standard, right? But in the patient with remission, I will see zero uh, albumin to creatinine ratio or any way less than two, that is the normal, uh, the normal level. And you don't need, if you have less than two, you don't need to, uh, to go to a full 24 hour urine collection. Is Benlista safer than cell sept in terms of adverse events or cancer risk? That's a great question because we don't have the, uh, the length of uh, data we have for cell set. We don't have it for Benlista. However, we know the drug for 10 years now and we haven't seen any significantly increased risk for, for cancer, I mean, for, for Benlista. For cell set, we know this for more than 20 years now. For Benlista, we have like a decade of data not showing any increased risk for, for malignancy. Now for adverse events, again, adverse events mostly goes to infections. And if we have infections or not, we have infections with both drugs. We have seen this and that's why we're trying to, uh, to increase awareness for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the vaccinations and all of these things in our patients and treat infections actively uh, and quickly even from the first signs of infection, instead of uh, waiting for the infection to, uh, to plug in. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Celius. I think you've answered all of the questions. Thank you so much for giving us your time as well. Oh, I'm seeing another question for oh. Paulette McDonald. No, it's, um, right. it's already been posted here by Lisa. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd like to thank Dr. Celios for this uh, really uh, interesting presentation. Obviously, lupus nephritis is a, uh, a serious issue that the more medications we can get and the more research we can get, 
the better that hopefully we can um, solve this uh, this mystery because uh, it is affecting a lot of our patients. I actually was going to sneak in a quick question and um, you may not know the answer, but uh, you mentioned the issue of, of non-compliance. And um, I'd be really interested because Lupus Ontario is very um, determined to improve access to medications for, for uh, patients. Um, how big an issue cost is in that, just that um, non-compliance? Uh, it, it is an issue. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. Particularly, particularly with the with the cell sept, mm -hmm. right? And they had plenty of patients over time to have issues with this, and we were trying to find solutions with the pharmacists and the uh, and then the manufacturer and everything. And in most cases, we were able to get to get something, right? Not ideal because uh, you know the cost is increasing with the dose. Mm -hmm. We were asking for quite a high dose in lupus nephritis particularly for the, uh, for the induction phase when the disease is active and we're trying to get everything under remission. And this is increasing the cost like disproportionately. Well, we'll have to continue to keep that on our advocacy list. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Yes. <laughs> of course. No, no, Lupus and Terry, I, I, I know you're dedicated in this and we were working together for the... Uh, uh, for the submission to Cardiff and we hope that this will work and we have some access for some of our patients at least. Well, we won't give up. <laughs> Hopefully, of course we won't give up. Of course. Well, thank you so up. much for your presentation and for everything you're doing. Um, this is, is mine. marvelous. It gives us hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll see everyone in the next session, which will be starting shortly.